Well, thank you. So over the next few minutes, um, I'm going to tell a story, OK, about how a fish can actually help us save the world. But first, I, I'd like to tell you a couple things about myself. The first is the Russian government, for a long time, suspected me of being a spy for the United States of America. <laughs> Now, it could have been the radio transmitters that I brought into the Russian Far East, which was not exactly a confidence-building exercise with our Russian partners. But we needed those radio transmitters to track steelhead. And it could have been the almost 100 hours I spent flying in beater Russian helicopters all over the Kamchatka Peninsula. But I wasn't looking for Russian military installations. I really wasn't. But what I was looking for were some of the last great salmon rivers on Earth. And, and that's what I do. I grew up just outside of Portland. And as a kid, I just roamed the hills uh, looking for reptiles and amphibians. And that was my real passion in the beginning, still is. And I missed a lot of the soccer games and, and play dates that most kids do. But what I got was a really deep a and af affinity for the natural world. Then my grandfather taught me how to fly fish. And soon I was an obsessed fly fisherman. And I knew all the Latin names and all the natural histories for the insects and, the, and the, all the animals in the rivers. And that led to, of course, a lifelong passion with, of angling. And, and saving these fish and those rivers has become my life's work. And it's also propelled me and my organization into one of the most challenging and difficult environmental issues facing our generation, and especially in this part of the world. And, and I want to explain that. So this is all we've got, and it's all we're ever going to have. And that beautiful, shimmering arc, and you can see we're right, right there, extending up across the North Pacific. You can see Alaska, the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia shrouded in snow. That feature on the planet Earth defines our community more than anything else. That's who we are, right? We're there with the Russians and the Canadians and the Japanese. That beautiful arc is where we are. That's our place. And in some ecosystems, there is a species upon which all of the other species depend. And biologists call that species the keystone species. And for this beautiful part of the planet, the keystone species are wild salmon because they migrate from the ocean each year. Hundreds of millions of wild salmon swim far up into the rivers that feed the North Pacific, bringing marine nutrients. They go, they swim up there, and they spawn, and they die, delivering nutrients into what normally would be rather nutrient-starved ecosystems. And they feed the wildlife. Almost all the species around these rivers depend upon that big nutrient pulse that comes in from the ocean. So bears, eagles, killer whales, caddisflies have all evolved around the annual event of the nutrients coming in. And so have we, the people of the North Pacific, time their lives and their local economy and traditions around wild salmon. They're not just another fish. They're the central to the health of the ecosystems across a broad swath of the North Pacific. And here you can see that red line. That shows the inland distribution of the salmon runs. And, the, uh, and you can see where they swim in the ocean. So this is a big ecological phenomenon. So if you care about the health of all those species, and if you care about the clean water that salmon need, and if you care about us, because wild salmon protein is one of the most important wild sources of protein for the human species. And if we don't mess it up, it will be a source of healthy food for us for a long time. So if you care about this place, and you care about these species, and you care about us, you've got to care about salmon. And the, and the final thing I'll say is that if you want to get the people in this part of the Pacific Rim to fight for the places that they love and the environmental health of their watersheds, not many people appreciate what an ecosystem is, but they love salmon. And so it's a very effective conservation strategy. OK. So, this is, again, the Pacific Rim. And on this map shows the declines that are happening to wild salmon. And the declines are marching up both sides of the Pacific Rim. Now, the yellow is where the fish are in real trouble. And the darker colors, they're better in better shape. And the dark blue is where there's the most salmon. And you can see that the Bristol Bay, Alaska, and Kamchatka are the big producers today of wild salmon. But what this pattern shows, as time goes on, the declines are climbing north. And it's very hard to turn that around. In this part of the world <clears throat> where we are, we discovered how bad it was about 1990. 
And by then, our wild salmon were down to about 7% of their historic abundance. Kind of in an 11th hour thing, we petitioned to list these salmon under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And now about half of our salmon species are listed for protection under the Endangered Species Act, one of our nation's most powerful environmental laws. Now, this triggered a massive and ambitious recovery effort that's cost hundreds of millions of dollars a year, more than any recovery of any species in the human experience, involved the commitment of hundreds of organizations. Truly remarkable. But unfortunately, it has not succeeded in recovering a single salmon population from the list of endangered species. Now, the problem is we need the Endangered Species Act to prevent the extinction, but it comes into play sometimes too late. By the time they're listed, they're almost in the emergency room because the populations are so low. And you know, every ecosystem, I mean, we need emergency rooms, right? But it can't be, every hospital needs an emergency room, but it can't be the first line of defense. We have to figure out a way to prevent them from getting to such low levels of decline. So the recovery, in some ways, we're stuck in this cycle where we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in recovering the most endangered populations, but we're not doing much to prevent the ones that are in relatively good shape from becoming endangered. And that's our challenge. So I'm a dad. My wife, Lee, and I have three boys. And you know, like their dad, they're becoming obsessed fishermen. But being a dad makes you think a little bit differently about things. And I know many of you can understand that. So Henrik, this, he's seven. And so I'm 52. So when Henrik's my age, global human population will have gone from six to nine billion people. And now, so anything we're seeing now, imagine the impacts in 40 or 50 years. And during that same time period, uh, the, the population of the Pacific Northwest is going to double. So Portland's going to be twice as big. Seattle's going to be twice as big. So these things are going to start snowballing. So anything that we want to deliver for our kids, we got to get to it. And it's really up to us now. Any of the environmental pressures we're seeing right now, imagine what they're going to be like in 50 years. We're not going to have a ton of more chances to really get things right. So I think it's, I mean, that's important to frame it that way. So the one thing in our, in our international and, and regional effort to protect salmon that we've not succeeded in doing is protecting the last great salmon ecosystems before they start sliding into that endangered zone. Now, strongholds are the last, best, and healthiest wild salmon rivers in each part of the Pacific Rim. They're the ones that miraculously <clears throat> have not been destroyed. They're the last that we have left. And if we don't protect these places, no matter what else we do, we won't succeed in protecting or restoring wild salmon. If we get this piece wrong, we can't get there. So this, I, we've built an organization around focusing on the protection of these strongholds. And our vision and our dream is a network of wild, protected wild salmon rivers that extends across the entire North Pacific Rim. And it's getting traction. We're working with our colleagues in Japan and the Russian Far East and the Pacific Northwest in Canada to do that. And if we can succeed, it would be a tremendous gift. And those yellow circles represent, within those circles are the best salmon rivers we've got left. And that's most of the production of wild salmon is coming from those places. Now, at, at this point, I'd like to emphasize or describe that right now, one of the most best last chances that we're going to have to protect strongholds is right here in the Pacific Northwest. So we looked at the, this part of the world, and the Oregon coast has the most important and the most vulnerable wild salmon rivers in this part of the, in the continental United States. And those rivers that you know, there's about 27 rivers that extend from the North Coast. Uh, the Nehalem is just right over the hill from here, all the way down to the California border. This is the Rogue River, uh, the Umpqua, some of our most beautiful streams are right there. Now, the reason that they're relatively healthy is because the headwaters are, for the most part, on public land, state land or federal land. And that land belongs to us, right? That's our land. And up until now, it hasn't been logged too heavily. It's been relatively protected. But the problem is there, there's intense pressure right now to increase logging on federal lands, both state and private. There's a proposal in Congress right now to double the amount of logging on federal lands in Western Oregon. 
including reintroducing clear cuts. So this is a threat to these rivers, and, it, and it's right now. The fate of those proposals will be determined in the next 24 months, right now. So it's all playing out. Now the second thing that we have to figure out, and I need to describe, are the private lands. So those rivers flow out of the mountains where it's public land and they flow onto private lands. This is private forest land just over the other hill, just west of Portland. All those light spots are clear cuts. And Oregon, unfortunately, has the weakest streamside <clears throat> protection rules in the western United States. And the private lands are going to continue to get pounded. And this is, if anyone that's been in an airplane can look down and see, this is what it looks like. So we've got to somehow protect the headwaters, and we've got to rebuild the lower parts of the rivers. And this is our big opportunity. So this is it. This is a salmon ecosystem. And there's the ocean, and there's the river. Now, to protect it forever, it really comes down to two things. There's two places that we've really got to focus. The yellow spots up there are the headwaters. We need the upper parts of the watershed for cold, clear water and a stable flow and refugia. But the biological engines in these coastal rivers are these lower areas, these swampy floodplain areas. <clears throat> and this is where the baby salmon swim to rear and to get fat enough so they can go out to the ocean. Now the problem is those places are in really short supply and they're mostly on private land, but we have an opportunity. So this is what the land ownership pattern looks like on, the, on most of the Oregon coastal rivers. The green is, is pub federal land or public land, the white is private, and as you can see the headwaters are on public land, so we might succeed in getting our elected officials to protect that stuff forever, and that's what we need to ask for. We need to decide as, as a society that those are salmon places and, and, and all the hundreds of species they coexist with, and let's keep them that way. But now we've got the lower parts of the rivers, but in here there's an opportunity. So we've basically got two big chances here. One is working with local landowners through land acquisition, conservation easements, or basically buying development rights, and restoration projects and incentive packages to see if we can't protect those lower rivers. We can, the opportunities are all there, but we've got to really focus our investment. But the second is kind of looking at us right in the face. Now this is the Umpqua River, and those checkerboards are the pattern of public and private lands, and those are called the O and C lands. And it's this crazy checkerboard that is an accident of history. And that's just the way they were set up. And it doesn't work for salmon, and it doesn't work for the timber industry. It's a crazy map, and we, we, if we want to save salmon, we've got to redraw that map. And this is, we have the political space right now to do this. We have the chance. So back to our map. If we could trade some of those far-flung pieces of federal for pieces along the river corridor through land exchanges, we could change the land ownership pattern and concentrate our efforts on protecting the lower river. It's fairly simple. It's not going to be easy, but there's a lot of energy behind this idea. And the decision to do this is going to be made again within the next 24 months. So it's a big lift, but it's totally doable. If we miss this opportunity, we're missing one of the best chances, maybe the best chance we're going to have. But if we can pull it off, we'll be delivering you know, for our kids and grad kids, one of the most spectacular gifts you could ever imagine. But we're going to have to redraw the map. Can a salmon help save the world? Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs>